Hello, everyone. We are very glad to see you joining us today for our event. And we will give two minutes to everyone else to log in. We will start in two minutes. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We are very glad to see you joining us today for our event. And Hello, everyone. We're very glad to see all of you today joining our event on uh, Living Innovation Project. This is our second event in the series dedicated to the challenges of remote working. And today we will talk about trust, surveillance and artificial intelligence. Uh, we already 50 persons and we're very Curious to see where you're coming from, what is your name, and if you feel like it is not that it is part of a surveillance, of course, but you can uh, add to the chat your name and where are you coming from. I wrote here, my name is Svetlana and uh, I'm from Italy. Uh, so we will start our event. Madeleine, could you please go on with the slides? Thank you very much. Uh, today, we, we have, as I said, the event uh, on trust, surveillance and artificial intelligence. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, my name is Svetlana Ivanova. I'm a researcher at ISINOVA and uh, will moderate uh, this event together with Andre Martinuzzi and he's a coordinator of the Living Innovation Project and director of the Institute for Management Sustainability. So a couple of uh, remarks for today. If you will have some issues uh, during the event, technical issues, please uh, call or contact Heike. She's today uh, in, in the contact list. You also can see her, Heike Vogel Parshall. And uh, you can see also on the slide her phone number in case uh, you need some help. So if you also have some questions, you can use the chat, as I see uh, a lot of you already doing this. And I see people from Salzburg, from uh, Norway, Austria, Macedonia, United Kingdom, Finland, beautiful. And uh, we would very be glad to actually see of you. So during the discussion, if you feel like switching on your camera, that would be great. Uh, so we will start. Next slide, please, Madeleine. The agenda for today will start now at four o'clock and we'll have introduction and some background information presented by Andre Martinuzzi. After that, we will have three wonderful presentation on very topical issues. Kirsi Maria Blomquist will talk about trust and the future of work. Then we'll have Harald Katzmeier on the home office and hybrid place. And Harald Leitmuner will talk about employee safety, security and well-being in a hybrid workplace scenario. After that, we'll have half an hour for question and answers here in the panel. And after that, we're very uh, we're asking you if um, to join us for the in-depth conversation. We'll have three sessions where we will discuss 
more in-depth if of each of these topics. So, uh, Andre, please. Well, also a very well, warm, warm welcome from my side. Good afternoon. If you're from Europe, I've seen that some of you joined from Mexico and from Canada. Good morning. Thanks for getting up so early to join this session. I haven't seen anybody from Asia that could be quite late in the evening. So we on purpose chosen that time of the day because we wanted to allow most of our friends and colleagues to join such a session. My name is Andre Martinuzzi. I'm coordinating this wonderful project, Living Innovation, for more than three years now. It's a wonderful project because it tries to communicate, it tries to frame responsible innovation as an opportunity, as a business opportunity. So not as a threat, not as a societal demand, which it is. In many cases, ethical issues could be a limitation for innovation and societal demands could be an orientation for innovation. But responsible innovation also is a big, big opportunity for businesses. And this is why some years ago, we started these initiatives together with 14 partners uh, to show that responsible innovation in the era of smart homes and smart health can be done, should be done, and is beneficial to be done. Next slide, please. Um, in this big project where we've done a lot of things. We've really done a lot of things. And if you're interested in what we're doing, just register at livinginnovation.net and you will see that we ran 20 workshops all across Europe. We run so-called joint actions and so on. And part of this large project is a series of dialogues on remote working, where we are today now in the second one. We had one a few weeks ago. It was late November where we kick-started this series of online dialogues dealing with remote working because actually we do remote working now for a year and we think that some elements of remote working are here to stay this will be the new normal perhaps not in our kitchen tables at our kitchen tables but um, in a certain elements will stay so we talked about leadership challenges and we talked about technologies this was a kind of setting the stage event and then we saw that certain aspects of technology and leadership challenges might be worth for a deeper dive and today we have the first of these deeper dives dealing with trust surveillance and artificial intelligence and they will be one more, at least one more, perhaps several more in March. In March, we will deal with virtual reality. And Svetlana, you already are in touch with two more experts for the virtual reality event, which are shown on the next slide, please. Could you please in briefly introduce them to our audience? Yes, we're actually quite um, excited about the next event and looking forward to hear uh, these two speakers. Um, and one of them is Simon Benson. He's a co-founder of Realized Realities, which is a consultancy where he helps different businesses to implement virtual reality technologies into the everyday work in the context of remote working. And the other one, of course, we have two sides of the story. Uh, Armen Ovansov will he is a principal director of Accenture Research, and he will talk about the risk and responsible use of virtual reality in business. This all will be in a mid-merge, and the third speaker is not confirmed yet. So if you know someone, or if you yourself would like to speak at our event, please write us, we will be very glad to consider you. So this was the advertisement for the third dialogue. Let's come back to the broader issue. Well, next slide, please. We talk about responsible innovation. And what does responsible innovation actually mean? Well, we try to translate this quite um, difficult concept that stems from policymaking, that stems from business ethics into a language that's easy to understand for businesses. And this is the magic slide that shows what it is responsibility means and what to innovate means. Actually, it means responsibility for impacts, to innovate with a purpose and to reduce the risks and costs, which is a business case for companies. Just remember Google Glass, big failure. Remember all the societal problems we had with contagon and asbestos. And there is a huge debate about genetically modified organisms in Europe, about nuclear power, about nanotechnologies, all of this causes certain kind of anxiety, certain kind of fears of, uh, in society. And to take the responsibility for future impacts and to innovate with a purpose is one element of responsible innovation. The second element is about the people. It's about a kind of openness. It's a kind of accessibility. It's a kind of 
participation for the people and with the people, to innovate with the people and the responsibility towards stakeholders. If you do so, which in many cases, many companies already do, that's the well-known concept of open innovation, uh, you integrate sometimes the usual suspects, perhaps you should integrate also the unusual suspects because then you get more and better fintech ideas. And the third element has certain links to sustainable development and to resilience, which means that responsibility is a responsibility within a system. Many innovat innovators, many companies, many researchers strongly focus on a technology, on a product, on a solution, but they do not have the bigger picture on the whole system. In many cases, the systems are the things that shape our lives, are the things that solve the grand societal challenges. So actually it's about innovating at a higher level within systems, then you can become a game changer, then it's about radical innovation. So this is what response for innovation is about. That's the broader concept. Next slide, please. If we now narrow it down to the purpose of our, our, our talk today, of our discussion today, it's about trust. It's about trust in remote working. And I would like to know, how do you secure trust in your virtual teams? Just please write a few words into the chat box. How did you secure trust in your virtual teams during the last month and even before. So if you work in a virtual team, trust is an issue. What did you do to secure trust? We just want to know a little bit more about you, a little bit more about you as an audience and also to have some topics we can discuss later on with our three keynote speakers. So it's up to you. How did you secure trust in your virtual team? Just one sentence, a few words. So we have already some answers here by creating a safe environment for everyone to engage. Great. Uh, Katrin Birch is writing regular check-ins with people, one-on-one -on -one conversations. Agree. Annette saying mostly having my cameras, which on so that my face, emotions and actions can be seen. Definitely agree on this. That is why we also ask you to switch on your cameras today. Focus on kindness and empathy in my emails. Absolutely. Through one-to-one -one conversation and, of course, GDPR and welcoming questions. Using camera. Yes. Okay. Building up relationship and addressing topics and issues beyond work and business team one-to-one -one conversation. A lot of very interesting inputs th here. Thank you very much for being active. Wonderful. We will see how these topics are addressed by our keynote speakers later on. If later on you have a feeling that you want to raise a question, you have something to add to any kind of input, please feel free to continue using the chat. We will try to monitor, we will try to summarize, we will try to make your voice heard, although with now nearly 60 participants, not everyone can switch on the mic. So we will have to find a way and that's the perfect way how to do so. Um, one more question to all of you on the next slide. If we talk about trust, then sometimes the question is you switch on a camera, actually then you observe someone. And if someone works in remote settings, you're not sometimes not sure what does she work, does he work, when, and so on. And we are quite used to any kind of surveillance, which is not called surveillance. In the normal office, just open the door, you go there and say, hi, how are you? Is this surveillance? No, but still we know what people are doing. On the other hand, surveillance might also be the case if an artificial intelligence observes you at home. And in our last talk, I talked to an expert from Atos, which is a big IT company and asked him, well, is there, are we already as far that there could be a surveillance based on our computer cameras? And could there be an algorithm that observes my eye movement, my hand movement, whatever, my mouse movement and what I, I do on the screen, and then calculates the key performance indicators that are delivered to my boss? And he said, yeah, yeah, Andre, don't worry, that is already, that can easily be done. And then we said, okay, we have to talk about responsible surveillance or is responsible surveillance a contradiction in itself? Is surveillance always irresponsible or could responsible surveillance be something interesting? What comes to your mind when you hear the term responsible surveillance? Please write a few words into the chat box. Well, 
So whatever comes to your mind when you think about responsible surveillance, just so we have from Mark. Wait, 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 wait a little, wait, wait a little, bit, little bit, wait, give them a little moment to think about because if you start reading, they will listen to you. Responsible surveillance. You could also say that's stupid. You could also say I'm doing that all of the day. If you never heard about the term and it's the first time, you can also note down, never heard about it. Strange thing, Andre, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we see someone says it's actually a new concept to me. And we see that responsible used with instead of on people. Interesting. So for some of us, it is new, but uh, some others say, why to differ differentiate between work in the office and the home office environment? It's a matter of trust into the team members. Thank you, Elka. And Barbara says, online coaching platforms like sharpest use this already to see the hot topics in companies also for personal safeguarding but with assuring guaranteed after period this should be co-created with the employees says marco thank you marco and uh annette is saying while driving this could be used uh, to keep you awake but the data shouldn't be stored and of course, Graeme Madden uh, says that people need to at least know about it at the very least. So they have to be aware of this. And Katrin is saying, I think it comes down to the company culture you want to foster. I don't understand why you'd want to use it as an employee. However, I think other results, KPIs should matter more. Thank you very much, Katrin. So uh, if you have other... Hello, I think I lost the connection for a second, but I'm back. You're back. Um, Carlo is saying that I think it's contradictory. If you're responsible, you know what to do and not uh, need to surveil during the task, only support it if you need it. Thank you very much for all your thoughts. Uh, please share them in the chat if something else comes to your mind during also our presentations. Next slide, please, Madeleine. So we present our speakers today. We will talk with Kirs Maria Blumwitz. Uh, she's a professor of knowledge and management at LUT University in Finland. And then we will have a presentation of Harald Katzmeier, who is a founder of FAS Research, and uh, Harald Leitmuller, who is the head of technology of Microsoft in Austria, will continue. Next slide, please. So this is our invitation also to keep uh, in contact with us after the event. Please join our uh, community platform, which is Living Innovation Pointed. I think most of you have already registered in order to register for this event. If not, please do this. The next slide, please. And our first presentation of uh, Kirsi Maria Blumwitz, uh, she will talk about trust and the future of work. Um, she will address the very relevant questions such, such as what is the current trust culture in Europe? What effects has COVID-19 and its implication for business head on trust? And how can leadership ensure trust in this new reality? Kirsi Maria, please. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. And can you hear me now well? 
Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Okay, lovely. So uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to talk about this topic. And I come from Finland, from Latveranta University of Technology, Lut University, please. So this is our uh, mission. And I will talk today about trust and the future of work or future of knowledge work, uh, more precisely, maybe, please. If you can move it, I will first explain a little bit what we were doing here last spring, and then I will talk uh, later about uh, the future of work, what we know about it, and then maybe what we can anticipate, and then I will focus on trust. But first, I would like to tell you about uh, the small experiment we did last spring, exactly when the pandemic hit uh, also Finland, and we went on lockdown the 16th of March. Uh, on that day, uh, we invited people, experts uh, across sectors in Finland uh, to work with us because we wanted to see how this country can work if we can't meet each other, if we can't travel, uh, how do we work? Is it possible? How far are we in this remote uh, work and culture? So we set up this uh, voluntary initiative. Uh, we called it Fast Expert Teams versus Corona. And the idea, our mission was to let's prevent Finland's paralysis. And uh, please, if you want to move forward, uh, actually, uh, we got 100, over 100 experts uh, from ministries, from companies, uh, from the public and private sector and from the universities. And we set up a digital kind of, a, if you want, a pop-up organization or community based on technology. We use the house space platform. And then uh, we kind of started thinking, what are the important questions that we have to deal in this type of situation? And then from bottom up, but also from top down, there were these questions that we started working in a more or less self-organizing teams. And we were working on the topic of remote work. I will present our research soon. Uh, and then one of the biggest tasks that we were working last spring was because at that time, it was not sure how much, uh, if you remember, there was scarcity of the high quality breathing masks. So uh, a colleague of mine, she had seen a presentation um, a, a few years ago where an other technology was innovatively, uh, it was used for another purpose. And she thought if this type of a technology could be used to clean these uh, high quality breathing masks in a large quantities in order to ensure that the hospitals uh, will have, have enough of these masks. And so this was one of the most, uh, maybe the largest project that we did all remote. And, and actually, um, then we were combining the people who had uh, knowledge about 3D printing, the professors across Finland and who knew the capacity and the materials, and then the industry. Or then we were kind of a trying to think new ways of uh, employed and freelancing work, how to combine, how to develop some faster R&D instruments, and then of course, best practices for remote work and how to facilitate uh, remote work. And, and we got, uh, as I mentioned, over 100 people and we used all kinds of technologies basically what worked. So we use Teams, Zoom, this house space collaboration platform, Skype, Google Drive, WhatsApp, even phone calls, because it, it was a crisis situation. It was quite difficult to reach people. And if you could reach somebody, maybe he or she would say, I have just two, two minutes, uh, someone unfamiliar person. And then you had to be really quick in building trust and explaining what it was about. And then maybe this person wanted to hear more. And then you could connect also other experts to the uh, online meeting and start discussing the things further. Uh, this cleaning uh, breathing masks, it involved doing the research, if this other method could be applicable uh, to also cleaning these masks. And of course, it is a very high risk venture, if you think about it, uh, with, a uh, with a COVID uh, virus, and it has to be clean, and it has to be functioning uh, as a breathing mask also afterwards. So we had uh, the research centers and universities were working on that. And then we also had to figure out uh, the logistics, how you collect all those masks, how you clean them, and how you deliver them to the, all the hospitals around Finland, and also how you train uh, the staff in the hospitals. And, and this was led by a colleague uh, of mine, and uh, Katri Latikainen, and, and we were a very 
close-knit team and afterwards it was actually uh, considered that we did this in six weeks which might usually in normal conditions take up to two years this project so actually when you use technologies when you connect people um, and you have the right people who are motivated and there's something important you want to do i think uh, we have a lot of opportunities that we can do and maybe we just don't see all of them yet they are here but maybe we just have to explore and learn how to how to collaborate uh, also innovatively online with people you have nev never met before i don't know these people i haven't met them physically even yet most of them uh, but uh, it is possible. So please, can you uh, move for the next slide? And then we also started uh, immediately research. So we also connected with the different people who were doing research related to the remote work across Finnish universities. We had people from six universities. We come together and we thought this is a wonderful opportunity. This is basically a research lab for remote work, the whole country, well, the whole world, if you want to say. And, and then we started collecting uh, longitudinal data. We developed a survey instrument for, for quantitative study and another one for qualitative study and and so basically uh, we collected data during the first weeks of the lockdown and we got over 5,400 responses for the first wave over 2,400 for the next wave in uh, May and then in the October over 1,100 and we are going to do the fourth wave uh, in March uh, when it will be one year. But what do we know now, uh, how Finns actually adapted to remote war work, what happened? And here are just a few uh, characterization, what we know. Of course, uh, this, is a, this is a cross university collaboration project. We are also publishing research papers, but these are now under peer review. So we've submitted some papers to the conferences and journals, but I can only say at this moment at the more general level, because we don't have yet peer reviewed publications. But what we can say, which is quite interesting, I think, is that there was high satisfaction, even in this very chaotic situation, situation when everybody was home, children were home, uh, things were quite in, in a crisis mode in March, but people were satisfied with the remote work and of course even more satisfied in October when things are already working uh, even better. And then employees, they prefer remote work even then and, and more now in October and they, they had uh, about half had, um, uh, uh, no, no, sorry, uh, about a majority, over 60% felt uh, that they had work-life balance already in spring and of course in October now uh, a large majority of 75 percent and they felt that actually working in the home office was really good for them. Uh, however, what we see is also now in time that people's energy levels are going down. If you look at the, the numbers from uh, May to October, so it's red, it's of concern. Uh, people are not yet anymore so enthusiastic about their work. Uh, they are still kind of, a, you know, okay uh, with, a, if you can say, 38% with the work situation. Uh, it's gone a little bit up. But the, the challenge that we had last spring in Finland and in all over the world was the feeling of social isolation and it's, it's gone up and then it's hard to generate new ideas in this type of environment. Uh, however, it's not completely possible, I must say. Uh, for example, I was talking today with, uh, um, with uh, Anna Anna, uh, who uh, I know uh, from uh, from Industry Hack, uh, which is a Finnish company uh, that has been doing this type of uh, uh, innovation contest, and, and they actually just told me that it's not really a problem because even in this digital collaboration, uh, they can do it, and the people uh, participating they do patent applications, and it's possible also to build new networks and new customerships. So I guess there's also a lot about about the attitude and the resilience of individuals and organizations, how we work. But anyway, so we would, interestingly, it was quite easy for Finland last spring. And, and actually in the Euromonitor research, Finland was number one of the countries uh, that were studied in Europe because about 60% of the Finns uh, moved to remote work in spring. 
And, and why that is, it is of course that in a country like Finland, there's a, there is this a broadband and mobility, it's covering the whole sparsely populated country. And then there's the level of education is high and, and people are quite uh, digitally savvy. And also there's a lot of digital processes in the organizations. But on top of that, I would say, and we know that is also about trust. But coming there a little bit later, if you're interested in reading this whole report, there's a website for our research consortium uh, where you can go and, and have a look. Uh, but what is also quite interesting, it is that people perceived that they are productive. Uh, majority of the respondents perceived that they were productive all through the pandemic until now. And also over 60% believed that most of their tasks could actually be done remotely. So basically, this is quite good news, and we were a little bit surprised that things were doing so well. But now when we look at the numbers and the trends, and we see the decreasing uh, enthusiasm, and we see uh, the increasing feeling of social isolation, even though uh, people were productive, they were satisfied, uh, it's still not all good news. Thank you. If you go further. Can you please? Thank you. So I think in the future, we need to be very smart on how we use our time and where and how we work. Because also what happened in Finland was basically we kind of moved from these meetings to online meetings, online meetings. And you, everyone knows that it's so tiring if you sit in the Zoom and Teams all day, even though in Finland, the number of work hours did not really go up. People were, of course, happy uh, they didn't commute, but also the productivity, the perceived productivity level stayed high. But in the long run, this is definitely not going to be sustainable. And I think, therefore, it's quite important that we try to uh, set our goal towards a more sustainable knowledge work productivity. And that means that we have to be feeling well because we are working with, it's an intellectual work with our brain, with our hearts, it's cognitive, it's emotional, it's a very holistic uh, work, what we're doing. And we kind of have to be careful on when we are online with others, when, when we get back to the hybrid mode, when we meet physically, and also I want to see, and, and we want to do research about much more about asynchronous ways of working together, because that will also support the work-life balance that I can choose when it works for me, and you can choose when it works well for you. And then of course, like in Finland, uh, we need also time uh, on our own. And, and for example, what I do, I walk in the forest, just get out of my yard. Uh, I do forest meetings, but also on my own. I think it's a great source of creativity. So kind of a balancing is, I think, will be even more important than now, please. If you can. Uh, so Maria, sorry, we... and you have four minutes left, sorry. Okay, yes. Okay. So if if you, uh, that's, uh, what could it be then, this future of knowledge work? Actually, of course, we don't know. Nobody knows. And that's, I think, why there's so much interest for the topic right now. So this is a kind of a hot topic. Everybody's trying to understand how will it be? What will be post-COVID? Uh, and, and what the offices will be like? How we will be working? And I think this is a very important, relevant question, because I think this is a very big transformation going on uh, for the societies and for the people and for the work. And it's hard to say yet uh, what it is, but it's important to do research and try to understand and develop these new ways of working. But of course, we can say some things, for example, that we need much more asynchronous collaboration, not just synchronous, because of this tiring and having the, the kind of the autonomy and flexibility, which we did not have in this time when it was forced abrupt move uh, to, flex, uh, to remote work. And then also this remote work is going to be most probably hybrid work. We're probably going to see much less offices, less space, but the space that will be used quite differently. Uh, 
And then another trend, which is yet smaller, but I think it will be uh, very important to attracting talent and also for giving people choice where they want to live, is work from anywhere, not that you work close to your office where you commute a couple of days a week, but that you can work from any place. Yesterday I was talking with a young researcher and he, she's working here in Finland and she said she's a bit envious because some of her friends are working uh, to Germany and they are now in Dubai or they are in some nice sunny warm places because it's you can work basically from anywhere. And, and from measuring office hours and presence, it will be much more about work results. And, and I think that probably was also one of the uh, issues uh, that um, Finland was doing pretty well, uh, moving to remote. Uh, and then there will be so much more diversity in the workforce. And that is a challenge for HR and supervisors because some are salaried, employed, then you have on-demand workers, uh, freelancers, a whole mixture of people uh, with whom you will be working uh, in different ways. And another thing, what, what we see in the research on teams and we see in the workplaces from stable teams, it has been to temporary teaming, exactly what I, I showed about these fast expert teams. This was exactly like the idea that there are complex problems and then you have the people who have specialized expertise who can come and work together for just a certain project, for example, and then they move on and, and work in another type of a, a setting and projects. And then uh, what is also the topic for today, uh, it is how we will use AI, how that can support our work uh, as knowledge workers in collaboration. And I would like to see it also to help us for the more sustainable work how it could be coaching me, how I can work with my team better, and maybe how we scale these new practices up. So I think in the future, uh, we need to create value. So this collaborative uh, creativity, value creation is important, but also trust. Uh, in Finland, uh, what happened with the remote work, we have very high level of trust, a kind of a cultural uh, issue and, and uh, it, it is in the Finnish culture uh, and in many workplaces as well. Uh, it's in the government sector and that helped us. But what we see also in this data, uh, which is not yet published, but submitted to the conference, we see that the level of trust is coming down during these months from March to October. And interesting to the topic of today, we see that it is uh, increasing towards peers, but it's not yet increasing towards supervisors. And, and this is quite important if you think you are in a supervisor position. If your subordinates, the level of trust is lowering, that is a really uh, critical concern because when the trust goes decreases, then something else is going to happen, which is no way good news for the organization. Please, can I have the next one? And what do we mean when we talk about trust? Actually, we have a research community, FINT, uh, with over 770 researchers from all over the world. And we are all interested about trust. And there are, of course, many definitions and it's a multidisciplinary topic. But basically, trust is about the individual organizational willingness to be vulnerable, willingness to take risk, because you have positive expectations towards the intentions or behavior of others. And we always have somebody or some, uh, some organization or some individual who is more or less trusting this disposition to trust towards other individuals, organizations, services, products, systems, and we evaluate their trustworthiness. And the trust uh, lives or evolves in these relationships. And of course, when it's about social interpersonal trust, then it's a mutual relationship. And, and it's, trust is a very dynamic, um, uh, so it lives uh, in these relationships. It's, it can be an attitude, it can be a decision, and we can see that in how people behave. And uh, it is really critical, as I mentioned, because you need trust. Uh, it has an uh, effect on communication, on collaboration and commitment. And it is more important the more there is risk or, or uh, uncertainty, if there's information asymmetry, and also when individuals and organizations are interdependent. 
Thank you. The interdependency makes it important if you can move forward. Thank, Thank you. you very much, uh, Kirsi Maria. Uh, I think the time is a little bit up. Do you want to somehow give some Wrap conclusion? Up. Uh, your time, yes, the, the timing is of, unfortunately is very restricted. So if you could maybe give some. Okay, I will, I will do that. So uh, it is important for, I think, to us to understand that trust is a multi-level concept also. It's cross-level. If we think of the societal level, so in a society where there is a high trust, it's much easier for the organizations, for example, the companies to collaborate with each other because there is already this societal trust. Or within the organization, if there's a trusting culture, practices, processes, structures supporting trust, then it's much easier for the individuals to work with together because there is already some basic trust. So that's all I wanted to say about this. It happens at, uh, across the levels, if you go further. And when we talk about how people evaluate trustworthiness, we look at the ability we look at the goodwill and we look at the integrity of the other individuals or organizations, but also in identity can be important when it's a very dynamic setting. And we would like to have predictability, but it might not be so easy to have nowadays, please. And I have two more slides. We can go skip this one if we are scarce of time. Uh, and we can skip this one if we are scarce of time, but it's important to understand that Trust is with peers, with supervisors, and within organizations. And it's more important in this type of a, a team project, interdependent setting, uh, because there we need more trust, the higher the interdependence, the higher the virtuality and diversity. And all these are elements in the future of work. Uh, can I have further? Can you move further? And something I think we have to see it nowadays more as a socio-technical systems. So basically we have this trust uh, in individuals and organizations, but we have also these technology systems. And, and together uh, they are important to take into account when they, we think about trust in organizations. And then we have the institutions that might regulate or support like culture, like the trusting culture can support the trust within the society. And then maybe one more and the final slide. So from the traditional world where we have had this high trust or more or less trust around Europe depends on the country and the organization and industry. But we now in, in this life where we are and where we are going to, we have to also consider not just humans, but also technology and the institutions from physical to also very much virtual context, context. And we have to be able to build trust fast. And it can't be just like the trusting, uh, but we also need to be analytical on what, how much, uh, we trust what is the risk and how is that changing and because we don't have this luxury of predictability we have to focus more on understanding who the others uh, are and what the situation is and especially I would say in this case of pandemic and leadership it's not only about this ability or competence but it's also the emotional goodwill uh, which is really important uh, for people and that might be an issue that we might not be able to transfer so well uh, in the technology mediated context and and uh, and maybe the last last point would be that we have to be also very actively rebuilding trust and kind of a pinpointing the situations in these very complex systems that might be deteriorating uh, the trust of our stakeholders. Thank I you very much, Karen. Thank, Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry. Thank you, Kirsi Maria. Sorry. So uh, we have wonderful questions in the chat, but we uh, will come back to the questions after all three presentations in the part for question and answers. And now we uh, move to the second pre presentation of Harald Katzmeier. Uh, Harald will talk about the home office as a hybrid place. Is the home office a private or a public space? How can leadership deal with conflict? And what effect does the home office have on creativity? Uh, Harald? Uh, I would like yeah. to share my screen. Can you please? Yes, please go ahead. Well, um, 
Yeah, thank you also for having me and our, our, I think our, I can our, our refer to our, uh, a lot of what was already said uh, in my talk, uh, but I actually really want to focus more on uh, the effects on uh, our relationships, uh, the way we are related with uh, others or and also with ourselves uh, when we work from home. And uh, I'm going to start with uh, this key question, why, why trust matters? I mean, it's always good to uh, sometimes uh, really uh, go back and start from square one and, and ask uh, why trust matters. And I, always thought uh, that this model by Patrick uh, Lencioni uh, was very, very spot on. It's also aligned with my experience as a manager of an organization that are, when you look at the, what are the actual key are dysfunctions in the team, it always starts with an absence of trust. No if there's no trust, things become really complicated. This is like trust is the single most important uh, decomplexifier of, in our world. So if you don't trust, things become complicated, complex. So absence of trust, fear of conflict, lack of commitment, avoidance of accountability and the inattention to results. Those are the five uh, big uh, dysfunctions and I've uh, really can strongly relate it to that also from a uh, practical point of view, but it's really the, the basis. And if you have uh, no trust and, no, and and you try to avoid conflict, et cetera, et cetera, usually this is a sign that you have frozen creativity and uh, probably even more importantly, uh, the capacity, the capability of leadership to self-reflect for self-awareness is sharply declining in, a, in, an, or, or in an environment like that. Of course, there's always this hand and egg problem, but I, we don't have time to go into detail there. So, and now how does a home office uh, work affect trust? Let's talk about what is a home office work? I mean, we're, there's this wonderful Ray Oldenburg's theory of places. Uh, you, you're all kind of are familiar with that. Uh, the third place is the public space. The first place is the private space at home. The second uh, place, uh, uh, work. So office is a kind of semi-public space. Or, and our, that's the office, how we know it. Or we're there, we're a different person. That's very important. So when you're we're shaping up, our role is shifting. When you're in your office, you're someone else. You're in a different role than you're at home. Why? Role is a relational context because you're, there's, a, you're, there's a different way you're related with the world, with others, with technology that's around, with the light in the room. So office spaces have their own gamut, their own, their own design. So it's different. That's the office we know it. And that's the home office. And here's the thing, it's a hybrid place. You're sitting there in your underwear. You're, you're, you're working from the same uh, uh, table as your kids. Uh, and even when you look down there at the right place, it's a public space because you're uh, the other than going with your colleagues uh, to the bar and to have your beer after work, you're, you're, you're sitting in, 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 in the room and you're celebrating uh, um, the birthday of someone in what, what, whatsoever. So what do we have like is a fourth hybrid place. And it's really truly hybrid because it integrates all three other places or it blends all three other places. So it's a private place, it's a workplace, it's public. And it's kind of like our, and as you see, there is some ambiguity arising. And I wanna talk about what the effects of this ambiguity is. And for that, we have to understand that those different places have different network morphologies. They have different uh, network structures. So a uh, home uh, is usually like a, homo a social circle, one social circle where everyone is linked with everyone else. Uh, the, 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 the office place, at least at the formal scale and when you have different units, is more like structured like a brokerage network with a lot of structural holes between different uh, units in an organization. 
and public spaces, that's where social circles intersect. There are kind of folding networks. You have like an overlap of different worlds when it's a, when it's a public space that's really working um, um, like, a, like a marketplace in, in Southern Europe or so. So uh, uh, the, 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 the key thing here is that if you wanna have like resilience in society, uh, it's important that you have like a, a kind of pulsing and cycling through this place. When you walk from home into work and then after work into a public space, you become like a different person and you are a different person. So you, and, and, and the thing here is through entering a different space and this is what psychologists know for, and, and, and for, for, for long, uh, entering, uh, uh, for, for specifically in the in psychodrama, that's what you'll learn. Entering a different place makes you different in a way that you also reflect about yourself in a different way. So for self-awareness, as we heard, you, you go out and have a walk in nature. Why have a walk in nature? Because the different horizont lines, the different texture of the environment creates a distance to your own emotionality. So your capacity to self-absorb, to self-regulate depends on getting out, getting out of, 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 of the room, getting out uh, uh, into a different, different place. And this like this cycle shall just indicate that a healthy life uh, means that you are in, that you're shifting and moving through different places uh, with, with different morphology. So those different places uh, and, and have usually different are different, as I said, are, are network structures, different morphologies. And to understand trust in network science, there's one basic uh, model that you have to understand. It's very simple. It's the law of triads, the law of triangles, as we call it. And it just means that if you have a one-to-one -one relationship between two people, like here on the left side, uh, we call it a di diet, a dyadic relationship. Dyadic relationships structurally are always weak. What does it mean? Uh, if we have no common friends, like in those triangles on the right side, you see on the right side, there, the, this relationship is embedded in four triangles. The, st the structural pressure in this relationship to align decision-making, to align action on the right side is much higher than on the left side. If A and B on the left side uh, disagree on something or there's a abuse in trust, the social costs are much lower than on the right side. So on the right side, there's a structural embedding that abusing trust, you pay a high price for that. So loyalty and to be trustful on the right side because of the structure, how this relationship is embedded is at a completely different scale. And this is happening when you look at different network structures are very fast. There's shared value and shared value. So we have like in, in, in teams, like a transactional dimension, but we always have also this relational dimension of shared identity, shared stories, shared hobbies, shared way to look at the world. Uh, the more our shared values, the more you move to the right side, uh, the tens of the networks get the more of those triangles you have. And the more triangle, as I said, the more, the higher the costs of abusing trust. And uh, <clears throat> why I bring this up is when you think about how our, usually the digital our, our work from home works, there's a strong tendency for like getting out of like this kind of clusters into a dietization of, of, of relationships. What do you mean by dietizations? You talk with your supervisor, everyone is linking with the supervisor and coordinating with the supervisor, but uh, there's like a, uh, a, 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 an absence of those environments where you really like engage in triadic settings. Believe me or not, to hang out at the same Zoom call is not a necessarily a triadic setting because usually it's a one-to-many communication. Like now, I'm I'm communicating with you. You you are like sixty or so people in the call. This is not. This is a, a very um, 
uh, asymmetric way of, of communicating. And it's very hard to have like this cross talk. Sure, you can encourage people, let's write something down in the box and, and comment on something. But we see how hard it is to have this kind of like deliberative, co-creative uh, 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 discourse. So there is like a tendency to, 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 to decrease the trust relationship because networks get thinned out or, uh, by the way, this is something that we know very well from research, networks under stress tend to die, 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 die. they pretend to become dyadic, tend to have like more hierarchical structural whole network uh, shapes compared with those kind of our uh, uh, structural fold networks that we want to see if they're really vivid, resilient, dynamic, agile, and robust at the same time. So, and again, what we see uh, when we are, uh, by the way, a, a good team uh, is kept able to move those different stages depending on the task. So different tasks require different aggregations and morphologies uh, in teams. But what I want to say here is that uh, we, I call this spasmatic condensation. If you always hang out at home and your family is playing in the background and you are sharing your uh, uh, work time, your time after work on the same screen in the same room, and then you have the stress of, 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 of delivering something. This is, and, and you're losing this kind of going in and out of this kind of changing different textures and high density, low density morphologies. Like our, here we're strongly, so if everything is condensed in one place, this is like a spasmatic our situation that's not sustainable, it's not healthy, it does not, uh, uh, it, it does not strengthen creativity, and uh, it's just like uh, uh, um, uh, 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 it, it, it just like uh, uh, it, it's an environment where the regenerative loop, uh, uh, the regenerative uh, stage in the loop, just has no um, um, uh, thriving environment. It does not find uh, an opportunity to 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 regenerate. Uh, Another thing, and this is the last one I want to share here. I mean, there would be much more to talk about, but I really want to be, keep it uh, uh, time uh, beyond time here. Uh, how does it affect, and this is something I really think a lot about, uh, how uh, does it affect our way to perceive closeness, proximity, and distance? When we're in a room, and this is something that we that there's a high cultural sensitivity in the offline world, how close we are and when it's the right distance. When we are too close, where we become like uh, cross a boundary of intimacy, or when when is the right distance? We all know when we enter our office exactly about what is the right proximity in this meeting, uh, so that we can engage with each other. It's a very complex biological. Uh, neurological process in our body that it feels right that, that there's the right distance. What is the right distance in the digital sphere? What is it? Are we not? That's, we, we are seemingly are in the same space. Are we close or not? Or are we? Or is there a distance? Is there like a? a, a, a what is it? Is, so we we post something that's that's in, that's in, in, intimate. We post something that's personal. Uh, is this some, are we now close or not? So there's like in the offline world, when you look at the left side, when you think about it's no real world to translate it as Stammtisch, as a group of people who regularly meet over years and there's a ritual of meeting again and again. Um, it's a German word, Stammtisch, it's hard to, to translate. It's a very stable and robust uh, a relationship stable in, 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 our, in the sense of we know that we're going to meet each other again tomorrow and the next years and so on. So this is like a, a place of high trust. Again, very high costs if you um, 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 if you do something wrong um, and misuse our, our, our trust uh, of friends. Uh, or you are in a team, in a team, there's closeness. You work together on something, you have to start up, you're hanging out in the same uh, office and you work on something and you have your meetings, very dynamic and agile. 
uh, though you don't know if tomorrow the air will be around because there's dropouts and there is mobility. Uh, we're here in a hierarchy. Hierarchies are like there for stabilizing relationships, right? But there are, there's a cool distance in the hierarchy, right? So it's like there's a supervisor. There is some kind of always um, uh, emotional or somber tone required in the hierarchy because we're not just, we're not friends. We're, you, you're my boss and so on. And then you have like networks, networks like in the, in the original sense, you go to a party, you hang out, you're doing networking, you meet new people, uh, have small talks and just checking out uh, uh, what's going on. And here's my theory, and I, I, maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I'm observing. It's digital closeness, what they call like when I talk with you in a video and I talk with you, like think about the YouTubers who think, speak very personal to you, create a kind of environment or a, a, a climate of closeness, right? Like a personal relationship. But there is like an ambiguity. This is like a, this is not this, this kind of relationship. So are we close or are we, are, are we distance? Are we close or are we distance? We, so there's like an ambiguity and this ambiguity in the clinical, in the, the clinical uh, syndrome of it and, and, the, and, and the clinical uh, uh, diagnosis of it is like the borderline syndrome. In the borderline syndrome, you're like really like uh, uh, shifting between closeness and distance constantly. So those kind of digital environments harbor a kind of borderline ambiguity uh, in terms of defining how close we are. And this makes a lot of problems when it's about also trust because trust definitely has something to do with the re reliability of something, uh, of the predictability uh, uh, and, 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 and therefore also like our, that it's holding, it's, there's a, a moment of, 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 of closeness involved. So, uh, and again, this just shall show uh, that there's a disorientation in the relational status. Are we close or are we not? Are we friends or are we not? Uh, 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 can I trust you or, can I, or, or not? So this is something that gets introduced. And this brings me kind of to a wrap up. Uh, and again, there would be much, much more to talk about. It's just the time. So I think are, uh, that are those kind of digital hybrid places if you get stuck into that or came along with a really increased risk to structurally weaken trust. It's a structural effect. It's not an effect of goodwill or of, 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 of willpower. It's just like hap it's happening. Uh, and the same like uh, that digital places show an increased risk of prohibiting the cycle to different places. So again, you get stuck in and this has a huge effect on uh, on your self-reflection, also, by the way, on your capacity for conflict. Conflict, need, you avoid, it's easier to avoid conflict in the digital sphere. This would be a different, uh, this would be another aspect, by the way, I haven't talked about it. I think there's negative effects on creativity, energy level, and the level of self-observation should be expected. Uh, and therefore, I think, yeah, team performance requires the pulsing. It's the recycling through different relational morphologies. In each of those morphologies and environments, you're a different person. And a digital fourth place, if you're cycling through it, can be a super valuable place. So there's nothing wrong about, don't get me wrong, I'm not looted. I don't want a, a digital, uh, 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 the, this fourth place is amazing it becomes like horrible if it's the only one. And I think we can agree on that. Uh, and our, so how can we, this is number five here, how, where are the boundaries? What, what kind of compartmentalization strategies and rituals do we have that we have zones where we know now we are here in the first, in the first place to, to use, uh, now we are in the second, this is the fourth place. And here it's really the public space how can we uh, guarantee or how can we design environments in a way that we, that we keep up those boundaries and thresholds uh, and, and those transition zones? Because, and this is, how I, this is the last thought before I stop, because this is the most problematic thing of the digital space. 
There's no north, east, west, south. I don't know what 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 do I mean when 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 someone is at the at their Zoom call on the right side or up or down from from myself. What does that mean? It this is a topological space and not a metric space to talk in the mathematical terms. This is not a Cartesian space. It's a topological space with completely different roles and therefore talking about distance and physical and, and emotional and physical distance is completely different and doesn't make a lot of sense. It introduces, it introduces a lot of ambiguity and I think are, uh, uh, we, sh we should be very, very uh, careful in our, in how we uh, how excited we are that we can work from home wherever we are in the world uh, uh, i think there's a time for that don't get me wrong it's great but uh to stay alive to regenerate we have to cycle there's a pulsing there, there needs to be like the shifting of roles this is what 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 renews us and keeps us uh um uh yeah happy and hopefully also um, uh, alive and hope, hope, hopefully also happy. That's like... Th thank you, Harold. Thanks. Thank you for a very interesting presentation and very positive remarks. And we will go on. There are uh, interesting conversations going on on the chat. We will come back to this after the uh, last presentation we have. And Harold Leighton Muller will talk now about employee safety, security and well-being in a hybrid work space scenario, workplace scenario. The role of technology in the hybrid uh, workplace will be addressed, the balance between privacy and productivity and ensuring effective online collaborations. Harald, welcome. Welcome. Thank you for inviting me to this virtual experience late in the afternoon. Uh, I will briefly expand our discussion in other areas, as we've heard before, I think we touched on, on trust a lot. Let me add some other uh, perspectives from an organization and some from a, a personal experience. Could you please go to the next slide? Uh, so I think we all agree that uh, we have seen a shift in how people work. They work more collaboratively, they work more across devices, more apps, the spanning up continuously new teams that work anywhere and anytime. Yeah. And uh, last year during the uh, pandemic disruption, which felt like a temporary disruption, we have learned that many of the things uh, might be durable and will persist beyond the pandemic. But to enable remote work for an entire organization, we have to ensure a great hybrid experience. And I call this experience, this is more than just technology meetings and so on. That's the whole uh, portfolio that's required here. It's not enough to measure usage of some tools. That's just a proxy for something. It's not ideal. And therefore, I would like to uh, focus on more things now. Could you please switch to the next? Uh, so let's agree that work does not start and end at meetings. And that's not new. We started an in initiative actually throughout Europe uh, more than 10 years ago, maybe some of you remember, it was, was called the home office day. So we proposed one day during a year at the beginning, at the end during a week to work from home. This was 10 years ago. The primary, primary idea at this time was uh, to reduce the carbon footprint. So if you stay at home for one day or work from home one day a week, uh, you could uh, in best case save 20% of your carbon exposure. That was the original thinking there. But we immediately learned that this wor world of work is changing. And maybe some of you remember this slogan, my office is where I am. This was uh, the branding, the term 10 years ago. And we uh, came up with a concept at this time that put people 
in the center of our thinking. I think this was the most important aspect of everything. Secondly, we thought about spaces, places, how we work, where we work, uh, to, to, to have choice between individual spaces to focus, to concentrate, or uh, to come together to be creative, uh, to brainstorm and so on. And the last idea was technology. How can technology support these two uh, concepts here? And uh, this was all about purpose-driven, objective uh, management, empowerment as an instrument for trust. We immediately learned that competences are required to leverage uh, this flexible work scenario. And it was the beginning of the big work-life balance. But it's much more. And if you, if you click once, uh, now we talk about and, and I would like to call this the intelligent hybrid workplace scenario. This is the searching for a new normal. And you heard this, we don't have the solution yet. We are just working on it. Yeah? But in the focus are now three new things. It's a discussion about collaboration, about learning, because there's a transformation going on and we need to learn more. And there's well-being. And well-being is not work-life balance, but it's, it's, it's much more because the influence of this workplace, the things that are included in this perspective is much broader. So we are talking about four things here. It's about the connection, the culture, the communication, how we bring these two together. Then the insights we need, because actually, if you think about uh, productivity, which is an company perspective and organizational perspective, that's the world of competition. We are competing about productivity. And on the other side, you have well-being. Insights should help to balance these two diverse perspectives. Then we call something topics. This is the idea of bringing knowledge and expertise together to find the right people that have the right knowledge to optimize the collaboration scenario, to bring the right people in the boat. And I mentioned learning already twice. So skilling and, and growth is a big challenge. We are in the middle of a huge transformation, digital transformation, societal transformation. And I think we should agree there is a big continuous learning and skilling effort required. So experience, includes learning, well-being, collaboration overall. I would also like to share some data and insights we you, with you we gathered last year uh, from our analysis, from our surveillance, so to call. Yeah? Surveillance is a gathering of insights, of intelligence uh, to make better decisions. Yeah. If you think it, at it from a positive perspective. Yeah? Just please uh, click once. Uh, we all agree that we need a solid privacy foundation to leverage or to enable these insights we get out from data. So we, for example, have two basic foundational principles here that, that data gathering is, has to be voluntary and uh, if it's personal data, it has to be accessed by the data subject. It's about only. Yeah? And if it should be uh, used for productivity insights in an organizational level, it has to be aggregated and to get rid of all personal information that can be accessed by manager only. This is what we call the privacy foundation in that context. Yeah. Next slide, please. So some uh, insights from the data we gathered uh, internally, uh, mainly that are very interesting. Uh, some numbers for you. What you see here is, is, is the timeline uh, during the day, how many messages are sent over the Teams meeting or other collaboration uh, settings. And what we, we see two things here, what two things we have learned. One is that the short meetings get more. So 22% increase in meetings shorter than 30 minutes or less. And on the other hand, uh, meetings longer than one hour have decreased by 10%. But 
also the overall working time during the day has increased a little bit. What you see here that our communication pattern also has changed a little bit. During lunchtime, we more tend to stay connected. So more messages are sent as not this uh, immediate break uh, and be away from, from work pattern. It's more connected, always connected. Yeah? And this is a trigger we should think about the leverage, uh, think about well-being. Yeah? Uh, the next slide, please. But we also uh, gather more insight by leveraging artificial intelligence or machine learning tools. Yeah. What you see here is uh, the mental effort required uh, to watch a Zoom, a Teams meeting in a classical setting. That's the, that's the right brain uh, chart here. Yeah. Because it's not a na natural setting that you watch uh, videos uh, that are side by side. So we learned that the natural way would be, we call this the together mode, that's a, a cinema seating more or less, like uh, when you are presenting on stage, you see everybody sitting in front of you. That's called a together mode. And our brain needs much more, uh, much less effort to deal with this setting uh, than with the other one. And this is crucial. Think about uh, uh, homeschooling, for example. If you are a teacher and you have uh, students watching your session, it makes a big difference if less effort is required to follow along than uh, the other way around, especially uh, you, if you have this setting all the day. Yeah. The next one, uh, the next slide, please. Uh, so what we are seeing here also, that's also some numbers from our uh, team's uh, usage. Uh, so to, to sum it up, this is growing exponentially. Uh, so this is just one year, uh, but it seems that this huge usage pattern uh, keeps growing in a tremendous uh, pace. So, uh, and why is this interesting and or important? Humans are really uh, weak in dealing with exponential growth patterns. It's very hard to estimate what does it mean in 12 months? Yeah? What's the pattern we deal here? How do we work? How do, does this really work? That's something that leads needs much more research and much more insights, much more metrics and analysis to take the right decisions here. And this brings me to the, the, the last uh, aspects and is something we should discuss in the breakout maybe. Just one more click, please. Uh, this is uh, respecting human values. So all that stuff that's possible now with the technology, with the setting, considering our productivity uh, ambitions here has to be built on human values. So there are more and more frameworks coming up, but all of these uh, have, have more or less six uh, common themes. Define accountability, be transparent, uh, leverage uh, things so that they are fair, uh, respect reliability, safety, privacy as a core foundation and security, and inclusiveness. Inclusiveness is also a very interesting aspect uh, in terms of productivity as people get older and especially in, in the setting we experience now. So inclusiveness is very, very often an, an afterthought. Yeah. So uh, in that sense, I hope we will dive into the details in the breakout session afterwards. So let me close with the last slide. Uh, the goal for us should be to create this people first setting and hopefully uh, without any barriers so that, that we can include everybody in our life here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harold. And we can start with our question and answer session. So please uh, write uh, the questions if you have in the chat and uh, we will try to address not maybe all of them, but some of them. Uh, Harold, may I start with the first question to you about uh, maybe you can give us some insight. When you talk with your clients, how do you define where this uh, boundary on 
responsible surveillance is going, how this conversation are developing when your client, for example, would like to look more into what the employees are doing and maybe uh, how, how do you uh, talk with them about these kind of issues? I assume uh, with Harald, I'm the Harald you are addressing here. Yes, yes, sorry, <laughs> okay. sorry. Latin Miller, Harald Latin Miller, yes. Um, I think that, that that's an easy one, yeah? Actually, the boundaries are clear. There are a lot of laws and things available. The main discussions we're having is about transparency. How do you explain what you're actually doing? Yeah? How can you document it? How can you, can you make it accessible to everybody uh, not to be uh, an, an data privacy expert or a lawyer to make it tangible what you're actually doing with the data? That's the big challenge. Yeah? With all this platform, with all this technology, to, to simplify the terms and definition and to make it transparent. That's the discussion I'm having with the clients uh, uh, to make this tangible for them. Thank you very much. Uh, and please uh, share other of your questions in the chat. Andre. Um. I would like to know from the two Haralds, just in a nutshell. We have a strange echo, Andre. Still? A bit, but I guess you can okay. go on. What I would like to know is what are, what would you what would you recommend? What are the do's and what are the don'ts in a nutshell that you would tell any good friend or any client? regarding trust and new workspace. What would they avoid in any way? And what are the things they should do in any way? Harald Leitenmüller. So if I were a, uh, one of your clients and you, I would ask you, what should I not do at all? What are the don'ts and what are the do's? So trust, I think uh, we agree, is very difficult to earn. It takes some time, it takes evidence, but it's very easy to lose. Yeah? and very hard to regain. So I think the first step is uh, be aware of this uh, <laughs> conflict. Yeah? Never lose trust. Yeah? And I address this uh, mainly to the management of an organization. Yeah? And that's also why we invest maybe a little bit more in the, on the management level in terms of trust awareness, trust initiatives than we do in the employee level. And that's what uh, something I would recommend to uh, other organizations also, at, at least at the management level, start with the management first, because if you lose trust, you will not regain it so easily. Yeah. Right, Katzmeier, in a nutshell, what's the most important thing we should not do? I think our, it's very dangerous to um, surrender into your kind of safe space at home and or that's the place where you can avoid conflict, where you can um, kind of feel, and you're, and I mean, there the safety is higher there in terms of like COVID, but our, it's just, don't, don't fall into the trap or show up at work, go directly there one time a week, do your testing before, be there in person. Um, you people, um, if, if you're not there, if you don't show up, you're, you're, you're sooner or later you're not relevant anymore. If you hold a key position, like you're a key engineer, et cetera, et cetera, because we were talking here very, very generally, right? So if you're like, our, but that the, but we we talked a lot about in in, in the past uh, how important it is to, to the capacity of, of a leader and an employee uh, uh, to have conflict and and don't avoid conflicts or and and, and 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 conflicts can be something very productive, but conflict requires or or. Or think about it. We all know that. I think. I mean, I, I, when when you're at home and you're constantly 
uh, confronted and, and related with yourself, with their, your own emotionality, and it's all about yourself and you and you and you. That's the great thing about an office. In an office, you're a different person. In an office, you have to step back a little bit from yourself, from your emotionality. There's other um, there's other standards. What you what you're what you do and what 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 you can't do and what you're allowed to do and not. So it's like again, it's like a semi-public space. And semi-public space always means distance from yourself. And to have a distance from yourself, the self-observation is one of the most important requirements to be able also to go into a conflict because you don't take everything personal. So I, I observe that not just like the people have lower energy, lower creativity, but they are less and less able to like, uh, and, and you know, uh, 90% of our work is operations and operations always means conflict, friction, always stuff's happening, unexpected things happening, always something, one damn thing after the other, right? That's the real, that's, that's what we experience every day at work. So, nice. and when you're, when you're at home and you try to avoid this friction, uh, that's, I think, the danger. So, um, again, uh, it was not just... Do we need a tool, new tool, Microsoft Conflict? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> conflict transformation, by the way, that's how they call it. Like, it's about mm -hmm. conflict transformation. That's like, make it... <laughs> the energy, use it. Uh, that, don't avoid it. For some people, conflict is an energy source. They, they need it. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Svetlana, you said you had more questions yes. from the audience. This is actually uh, what Harold Latin Müller is saying about now that for some people, uh, conflict is a source. But uh, this is actually one question in the chat similar to this. And the question, I think, probably for Harald Katzmeier, but also for Kirs Maria, is an interesting one. Because uh, in this network analysis, and when we understand the trust, uh, how do you think of and address the question that different personality types might prosper in different ways? Sure. I mean, I, I don't know, Harald, do you want to go along? I'll go ahead. I mean, or. Who should start? Yes, please start. Okay, well, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, of course, it's different personality types, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, uh, but eventually, again, um, um, I mean, I'm, I'm a network analyst and I are, think that our, our structure or the pattern of relationships are, are are stronger than like the individual um, uh, the individual personality type. Usually it's that the personality types and roles in the network, they align. So different roles require different per personality types. Uh, but, but generally uh, there, are, I think uh, um, um, that are what we've, what we've heard before, this was sort of like very interesting um uh, uh from 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 uh here is Maya uh that she said that her study showed that there is a decrease in trust in the supervisor and it seems to be like a uh a, a bond that an increase in trust with your peers which means like you start to kind of that 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 the link between uh, what I call this thiodization. So it seems like the breakdown, the collapse of, of, of triads in relationship with the supervisor, uh, which is, uh, uh, and maybe um, uh, you can, you, you, you can uh, 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 say a little bit more about the, your, your, your study uh, and, and your research, because I think this is, again, this is serious, uh, serious source of potential uh, polarization, mistrust within like, oh boy, that, that's, that, that's, that sounds interesting to me. Yeah. May I? Yeah. Yes. Yes, please. Yes. Um, uh, I, I think there's been really, really good points said, <clears throat> said here. And basically, um, I think what is going on, because we also have these uh, open written answers, and then we have some other material. It is 
pretty much like what Harold Katzmeier was saying, uh, that the supervisors, they are not used to uh, supervising, leading online. So basically, because these trust relationships, they were built and renewed in face-to-face -face context in the offices, of course, also online, both in our work. But now it's all online and they are busier than the subordinates because they have to reorganize things and, and their hours are going up more. It might be that they have been too invisible. And with the peers, you know, people realize, oh, we, the life goes on, we continue working, we can do it. So they have this feeling kind of a solving the problems with peers. But if the supervisor is not proactive, if he is not visible, because as Harald Katzmeier was saying, that you have to go to the office, but if you can't, you have to become visible in the digital space. And you have to show benevolence or goodwill for your people. And you have to find ways on how you communicate with different channels and different ways for different personalities. We know that the trust-based communication uh, for some people, it might be that they want to see the big visions and get excited. And for other people, you have to be very structured, kind of a careful step by step how we will go further. But I would say that the leaders need to be proactive as human to human, try to listen, take the perspective, understand what is going on with others, connect one to one, maybe take a walk in the forest, have a short conversation, and then have podcast communication, blogs, kind of a keep be present for the people uh, in the way they need. May I add one uh, aspect here? Uh, so from a corporation perspective, uh, if you have a diversity agenda, it's much easier to deal with different personalities than not. Yeah? So this is one opportunity to, to expand your diversity focus uh, not only on gender and culture, and also on, on personality types. Yeah? Uh, and exactly. This... That's that's yeah. That's really great because you need different people for creative outputs. And, exactly. and and for that, I think also if you have a positive emotion, then it helps you to see the other people more broadly and build the relationship. So the positive affect is a key here. I think also. Yes, and this is a wonderful question also with Carlo, I think, that uh, when I start reading that it's not just, it's important that leaders can be role models, but also kind of a bottom-up initiatives. What do people need? Different organizations, different work tasks, different people. It's not one size fits all, but they're different needs. So we have to listen and, and give space for these initiatives. Also to get people engaged and feeling to be part of a more of a community than just waiting for somebody to say what to do or, or show up in the meeting. Yeah. So this last question about the mix of uh, how much home, how much remote, I think that that's a delicate one. Yeah. So we have to respect that we have different type of work settings, different type of personalities. Work is changing, so the profile of tasks is changing. Uh, what we need here is empowerment empowerment so that people can make their own decision what's best for them to achieve their goals and that needs trust at the end so that's that that's the, it always will come back to the trust setting and so on and it will need uh, education and skilling and training uh, to make to enable and people that have to be empowered uh, to work on their own ways to achieve their goals i think that's the, that's the the magic circle here uh, we should come up with. Just one warning, uh, we need to get rid of measuring productivity with time. Yeah? So there's one slogan, maybe you heard this, in the future we will only measure with time in jail. Yeah, yeah that's a great slogan, thank you. Well, I would like to ask one question. Is there any technology that you would expect to come to the market or to our homes in the next few years that will have strong impacts on trust or distrust? So is there any kind of key technology where you say this is a game changer regarding trust by boosting trust or by really undermining trust? 
Uh, an e easy answer would be that the technologies are just tools, right? So it depends on how we design and implement, adopt mm -hmm. them. If we do it with the people and they can be, as we said before, if it's transparent, if they are part of that. So, so I can't say one single technology that would be evil or good, mm -hmm. but I, I hope that we will have maybe more immersive technologies also, maybe we will have more like feeling like some that calm us down, that give us kind of a different spaces where we can connect with each other. Harald Leitenmüller, you are chief technology officer and you're always the one where I think he knows best what will come up in five years. Oh, so uh, what, is, what is Anteportas? May, may I be provocative in that context? Yeah? Please. So trust starts where competency ends. So when we fail with educating people in digital competency, every new technology will be mysterious and we have a trust issue. So if we focus on skilling, educating people to understand, to make it transparent for them what it's actually doing, especially in the context of artificial intelligence, yeah, to know how this mechanism makes or prepares data or even makes decisions for us, that's crucial. If it's mysterious, uh, you stick on trust. <laughs> and if you have a negative experience, you will never trust this piece of technology again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's more the issue I see here. All right, Katzmanner, is there any kind of game changer regarding trust where you would say, if the, you, you said, uh, working from home undermined the informal, the undermined the triadic relationships. So obviously there, something was breaking apart. If we just go back to the office and we are there, then everything is okay. So is this just the end of a crisis? Or is there anything else to say, if this happens on top, then we have not a severe problem, then we have a dramatic problem. Or is there any solution also from a technological point of view? <laughs> I think you can you can uh, talk with the colleagues in China uh, on uh, uh, regards their their social credit uh, system, which is set up uh, to have full transparency uh, and to uh, punish those who are um, misusing um, uh, or abusing trust um, and are it's scalable. Um, you have now in, in China, they are um, implementing in, in every classroom uh, around China a video camera that monitors are 60, uh, um, 60 times per second every facial expressions, the, 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 mm -hmm. the resistance of the skin to look at our, how uh, concentrated the kids are, are they happy or not. It's like what I'm saying is there's a lot of dystopic uh, opportunities to use technology to in the name of trust. And, our, and, uh, and I really want to uh, uh, um, um, support uh, Harald's, uh, uh, Harald Leitmüller's uh, argument here. Trust is always needed because we have not the same level of information. So if I would know the same as you, about why should I trust you? So, and there's like, I see a strong conflict, uh, Harald, and that's the problem about your Microsoft uh, uh, pyramid, that uh, uh, the more transparency, the less trust you, is required. So it's like, a, there's like, uh, you need trust because not everything can be transparent. That's the reason why we trust others, because we never will have like the same, the same uh, level of information. And therefore, sometimes transparency leads, increases the culture of mistrust. And there are things like, and this I'm laughing about the blockchain technologies, because this is like, uh, I was like at the, in, 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 in uh, uh, before the lockdown in, in, in California and Berkeley, and there was like a blockchain conference or next to their arm, arm, uh, uh, next to Berkeley. Anyway, it doesn't matter, but I, I was talking there with somebody about our blockchain and alternative currencies. And I was like, what's, what's all this thing about blockchain? And I'm curious and I, I don't really get it and so on. And so I'm saying, hey, Harold, can you imagine how great that is? With blockchain, we can do business with people we don't have to trust. 
You know, it's technology. We, I don't have to trust you anymore. It's great. We have blockchain. So you're asking me what, what technologies are kind of waiting for us who could be like a game changer in the world of related with, with trust. And so I, I think there are some like pointers for blockchain Chinese um, regime. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Hard. I think a great point about the blockchain. Also, we have an interesting comment from Mars here about that the generational work uh, space, that workforce will have younger bosses, 25 instead of 50, and some workforce will be slow on going digital. I think it's something very relevant. And uh, the question which Carlo addresses, I think it oh, we would be very happy to see your responses in the chat on this. Uh, Carlo asks, so, uh, to our participants, how would you feel be yourself really empowered? What support, skills, and organizational changes would you be needed for this? So in these last two minutes of our panel, it would be great if you could answer the question. So how would you be yourself feel more empowered and what kind of supports in terms of skills and organization you need for this? Um, we give you one two minutes for this and slowly we will move our discussions into the three parallel sessions. Uh, the one uh, session which remain remains here in the panel will be the one on um, resilient organization with Harald Katzmeier. The other two groups will go to the additional Zoom links which now we have received in our chat. The one with uh, Kirsi Maria Blowitz on trust and base leadership, you'll see the first link. And with Harald Leitenmuller on responsible surveillance, the last link. So yeah. <laughs> thank you very much, Harald Leitenmuller, and thank you, Kirsi Maria. Participants will join you in these two sessions. And I will stay here with Hart Katzmeier for the session on resilient organizations. <laughs>